Oh, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for dropping by. Um, I've got a little bit of an impromptu video today um, because I went to an event last night um, here in Leeds. It was the Leeds Salon. Now the Leeds Salon is uh, not uh, related, I believe, to the uh, Salon uh, website, but um, it's uh, a little bit in the left kind of ballpark like that. Now the topic for the debate um, which was held at the Carriage Works in the centre of Leeds was uh, the future of uh, democracy and we had three guests. Uh, one was a Scottish gentleman from uh, the Institute of Ideas in London called Alistair. Um, there was a uh, gentleman who uh, was clearly from the far left um, called Stephen and then there was a the former MP for my um, constituency Leeds West Michael Medicroft um, and he was superseded by uh, John Battle in 1987 so Michael Medicroft was a Liberal Democrat and um, obviously we were talking uh, mostly about um, the Brexit election because that's what's going on at the moment and um, it was quite, I didn't really find the discussion actually terribly enlightening because so much of the time was spent justifying or not or arguing against the uh, whether we had a referendum last year. Well, we did have a referendum. It was decided in Parliament. Uh, it was part of the public, uh, part of the Conservative manifesto. We had the... Um, uh, we had the referendum, it was a decisive uh, vote, we've been through blah blah blah, all the stuff that's happened since. And uh, the leftist guy particularly was still going on about it, um, and uh, how he didn't think it should have happened, and then uh, Michael Medicroft, the Liberal, um, was saying, oh, he didn't think that referenda should ever be used, it's just um, absolutely, um, completely up beyond the pale, uh, it should all be left up to the elected representatives, even if they decide to do things which they never discussed in their manifestos. <clears throat> and, um, well, the Scottish guy, he was a bit more reasonable. Um, he, um, you know, agreed that it would probably be better to uh, for Britain to cut loose of the EU. But there was absolutely no discussion, other than my friend who I was sitting with, um, she raised the point at one point about the uh, completely undemocratic nature of the EU and uh, the way that the people there run it. So um, it was kind of ironic that uh, we were having people tell us um, the failings of democracy, and I might get onto that in a bit, but um, at the same time they uh, completely blasé about the completely in. Um, adequate and undemocratic systems we have for representation in the EU, which is principally why I'm I, I'm glad we're getting out. Um, one of the things that came up was um, it was a kind of you have this complete cultural Marxist um, kind of reversal of values because um, there were these people up there, principally the two lefties, um, saying how. Um, awful it was that these uh, uneducated oiks um, were allowed to have a vote that could actually take us out of the EU and this was completely, you know, we, we should, um, we, we, we heard about the uh, how we're moving into the um, <clears throat> post-democratic age, the technocratic age. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, remarks that people like Peter Mandelson made after the um, uh, referendum result. Um, I'm sure it was him, but somebody said um, something to the effect of this was too big a decision to be made by the people. Oh yeah, people like Mandelson, you know, we really trust him, don't we? <clears throat> right, so it was quite interesting because um, the speakers seemed to be unaware of the irony that they were complaining about the um, whether, you know, dem democracy was being properly implemented and at the same time um, suggesting that uh, 
these chavs, you know, that most of the population are made up of, it would seem, um, by their view, uh, had the uh, audacity to vote to get out of the uh, EU um, uh, against what they clearly wanted. And um, I was very, very impressed that um, the camera guy, um, I made a video, but it had some technical problems. The camera guy, they had their own high quality video. Um, and the camera guy ma made this point that they seem to be complaining about, um, you know, the failure of democracy and, and complaining about the people who, who were actually comprising the democracy. And um, <clears throat> I'll get on to this in a bit. Um, but uh, it seems to me that they're perhaps some of these people not satisfied that we've yet been outbred. Um, so what it was, yes. Um, really, I'll just get straight to the, the main point here, because I, I found most of the questions really kind of fairly insubstantial. I mean, you know, they covered some minor points about... Uh, you know, what caused people to have these different opinions and such like that. But I, I didn't think it really went very far. And I managed to, um, anyway, get my oar in. And uh, I hope this is something that my um, some of my subscribers uh, will enjoy this little story. Uh, it's the kind of thing that goes down well, I think. Um, because um, I, um, only the word until um, about two-thirds of the way through the evening, the word immigration had only been mentioned once by one of the questioners and it was a fairly tangential remark, so it wasn't a major point of the question. Um, so I, uh, when I got my chance to ask a question, I put my hand up and I said, well, I'm not, I'm one, the, uh, the subject of immigration has only been raised once, even mentioned, and um, surely this is a really big thing because I said, since we've been suffering the uh, invasion of uh, migration in the last 20 years. So, and then at that point, there was this, like, this, um, this, uh, this babble, this roar of, of heckling and, and shouting at me, booing from people behind me. <coughs> I don't know whether there, there were any names called. Um, that... Uh, so I said, uh, will you let me speak, please? And they carried on booing, jeering. I said, um, this is exactly what the left always do. They shout people down before they've even finished what they are saying. Because I was saying, I managed to say, after I had said to them, and they were just booing and jeering, there was about, must have been half a dozen people in various different parts of the room, but mostly in a bunch behind me. And uh, I turned around and said, will you shut up and let me speak? For crying out loud, these people, they're so ignorant, they're so arrogant. These bloody middle class lefties, the whole place was full of bloody middle class lefties. And I'm middle class, but I'm not a lefty. I hate middle class lefties. Uh, anyway, so what I said was, look, I wouldn't be raising this question. It wouldn't be, a qu it wouldn't be an issue with a m hardly any people in the population if... We had not had the mass invasion which has taken place since Blair opened the doors in 1997. Um, this is a whole issue with, with the right, isn't it, obviously? You know, and we have to have our, our borders, you know, borders, boundaries, our limits. And where, you know, because um, obviously, you know, it's, uh, we have to be, we have to distinguish between who are the opportunistic sponging migrants who have come here recently and the more um you know acceptable ones who have been in the past and become part of our country and all that uh, not that i think mass immigration has been a good idea in the past and labor's always been responsible for it but in this particular context i was drawing attention to the five million or so increase in population um, of foreign people who have come into our country since 1997 when tony blair it's 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 commonly known it's he opened the floodgates he opened the doors he invited um unlimited quantities unlimited numbers of um foreigners into our countries and i quoted i said look 
you know, this was the Andrew Nethern story. It's about 10 years old now. I think it was 2007 or so. And um, how Mandelson said that he had sent, they'd sent out search parties looking for immigrants. And Andrew Nethern had said that um, uh, the purpose of this with people like... Um, Tony Blair and Mandelson seemed to be to rub the socially conservative majority's face in it um, and obviously, effectively, destroy the demographic of our country. This is what I was referring to. And um, I didn't really get a proper answer from the speakers um, because basically I wasn't really allowed to complete my question. Um, what I wanted to point out was that uh, untold numbers of people, at least five million and probably considerably more like seven or eight million because of the number of Brits who have been leaving to America, Spain, Germany, um, um, that um, the, 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 the demographics um, have, have been more, even more of this more than this five million net increase of uh, foreign people um, and uh, again another thing I didn't get a chance to say was of course that many many countries Mexico for an example has very very strict uh, immigration laws and uh, they don't mind people coming to work but actually getting citizenship and the vote is extremely hard in many countries many second and third world countries Mexico um, many, many words. The um, Arabic countries, it's almost impossible to even get a work permit in an Ar Arabic country unless you're extremely highly skilled uh, in a technical profession. Um, and um, we all know that the Arabic countries, none of them have taken any of these uh, refugees. And uh, I have a friend who um, worked, uh, her, far, her, her husband worked in um, Zambia. And she said that she very much doubted whether they would find it, even if they'd worked there for 15 years, um, providing service to the country, she doubted whether it would have been possible to get Zambian citizenship. And even if they had, how would they have really been treated as white people in an African country? So, you know, we have to ask the reverse question. How can we consider all these people who are coming from completely alien countries to, you know, have a legitimate interest. I mean, this guy who was the only person who was anywhere remotely, um, you know, on, on the right of the conversation, who was at least pro-Brexit, um, had introduced his uh, talk by um, citing the uh, proud history of the development of demogra uh, democracy um, in uh, Britain, and I would say England. England is the mother of parliaments. Um, and uh, of course, the the, the civil war, um, uh, the restoration, the uh, evolution of uh, constitutional monarchy, the reform bills in the nineteenth century, um, universal suffrage um, in the twentieth, which has its downsides. But perhaps I'll leave that for another time. Um, and uh, so I was trying to cite him and say, yes, well, these people who have, you know, are people who have um, developed the world's first, you know, supposed democracy, you know, um, the mother of parliaments. Um, um, should we not have any concern as to whether the people coming into our country have any interest, any vested interest, any inherited interests um, in our um, historical democracy. And certainly some of the earlier uh, immigrants, the West Indians and the Indians and, and uh, the early people, they seemed to go for it. They seemed to want to be part of that. But, you know, um, we still have to accept that they, they were an alien influx and that it was Labour who did this. And we look back and we wonder why Labour was so keen. Every time Labour got in, they were in, in keen on increasing the um, amount of immigration and the number of migrants. Um, so 
basically, I was trying to say, look, particularly what Tony Blair did since 1997, and we're still suffering from, um, is a demographic invasion, which is was quite clearly designed to change the demography of this country. Um, I think it's well known that uh, immigrants vote uh, for left-wing parties uh, in a proportion of about four to one. Eighty percent tend to vote Labour. Um, uh, obviously, there are small. You know, there is a twenty percent portion of them, like perhaps some of the, um, you know, the Sikhs and the Hindus, um, who are more interested in you know kind of developing the potential rather than. Uh, um, seeking to uh, over overturn and change our society and our culture. Um, but this is the proportion we're up against. And um, we, n we I was not allowed to get anywhere near that. I was very disappointed with the, um, unfortunately, the moderator, who, who was most of the time quite good, but I was disappointed that when the, um, the guy who was pro-Brexit um, said that uh, he was in favour of freedom of movement, and I, and that was that seemed to be you know oh well yeah we can leave the EU but I'm in favour of freedom of movement. So, I I said well, what what does freedom of movement mean? I mean freedom of movement is great. You know if I wanted to go and have a holiday in Italy or Greece or or Russia or India or anywhere around the world, it'd be great to be able to go there. Just you know go there, um, have freedom of movement. Just check that you know my, I would expect my passport to be checked, you know, make sure I'm not on a terrorist list or anything like that. But um, I, so I said, well, what is, what is freedom of movement? Is this freedom of just movement for business and travel and holidays and great, isn't it, you know? Um, or does it mean that these people can settle? And if they settle, do they get citizenship? And if they get citizenship, do they get um, the electoral franchise. I mean, these are questions which directly affect the future of democracy, which was the subject of the debate in the evening. And the the moderator said, we've had a discussion about immigration in previous uh, months and we'll have another one again in the future, but this is a side... No, it's not a sidetrack. It's not a sidetrack. We're talking about the democracy, the demographic population the indigenous population of this country being flooded out by migrants, immigrants of whom 80% will vote for Labour. Is it any surprise that Labour, Corbyn, Abbott, all these people, they hate the white population, they hate white people. Abbott says this country is a racist hellhole. Well, I'll tell you what you should do, Diane Abbott. You should bloody well look in the mirror and look at your own racism because it's just absolutely unacceptable no other country outside of europe and the european or white nations would accept this kind of criticism from other demographic groups we have nothing to be ashamed of i am really proud of the fact that i belong to the nation england which was the prime mover in the british empire which was the first civilization the first strategic power in history to abolish slavery within its jurisdiction, right? So I, I think that's a pretty fine achievement. And we did that through um, realising that we could uh, raise ourselves through um, industry, that the steam engine um, was uh, terrific and what and all that. I've said these things before. Um, they should be honoured by the slaves who were freed because they allowed it to happen. But anyway... We never got anywhere near any of that. Um, and um, Michael Meadowcroft, the former MP, he just said, oh, we've always had immigration. Well, it's, this is just like the people who say, oh, the Pilgrim Fathers were immigrants. Yeah, they went there and, of course, the uh, local tribes gave them, you know, benefits, house. No, they didn't. The, the, the Puritans arrived there, half of them died or something. I mean, tons of them died. Um, and then they, then people would say, oh, well, then they went and, uh, you know, um, uh, it was a long process, a long, long process. And uh, it's the same thing in this country. You know, um, we had a few Romans and various people from around the Roman Empire left 
here when the Romans left in the year 410, I think it was. Um, and uh, then because of the collapse of the Roman Empire, the ingress of Attila the Hun, a um, bit of major climate change in the 5th century, um, I think there were some large uh, volcanic eruptions and a bit of uh, cyclic um, cold uh, mini ice age. And uh, so the uh, the Teutonic tribes um, headed south and west. And that's why we have the um, the Saxon and the Frisian and the Angles, um, who didn't come, you know, compared to today, they only came in a few tens of thousands because the country only had a population of, excuse me, two million or so um, at the end of the uh, Roman occupation. Um, so a few tens of thousands could come in and, and you know, create a kingdom and we had this for several hundred years and then the Viking, you know, then the Anglo-Saxon kingdom settled down and, and came to kind of balance with the Celts in, in Wales and so on and so forth and uh, then the Danes came along and there was a bit of uh, um, more argy-bargy between the um, Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and the Danes, you know, King Alfred, Canute, all that stuff uh, and then it settled down again because, you know, um, the most powerful um, and uh, um, group, the Anglo-Saxons, the people who wanted it most basically um, managed to establish their dominance and uh, then that like, went on for uh, 150 years or so, uh, a couple of hundred years and then um, Duke William of Normandy, uh, he uh, made his claim, uh, it's a complicated story but anyway they were related, the Normans were very closely related, I mean the uh, the Norman royal, f the Norman um, ducal family was um, related by a marriage to the uh, English uh, monarch who was childless, unfortunately. Uh, story we hear about too much. <coughs> and so then 10,000 Norman knights came and uh, invaded this country and took it over. And if um, King Harold had had a few thousand horse... And if he hadn't had to uh, march back from Stamford Bridge, where he'd already defeated the major power of the North, King um, Harald Hadrada and uh, his half-brother Tostig, I think it was, um, then uh, he would have almost certainly beaten uh, Duke William because he'd have been waiting for him on the beaches. Uh, it was just unfortunate that um, Harald and uh, Tostig did um, Duke William's work for him. Um, and then we had several hundred years of uh, extreme class division, which gradually eroded between the uh, the Normans and the Anglo-Saxons. But that took a long time. It took several hundred years. And it probably wasn't until after the Black Death um, in 1348-1349 uh, uh, that the social divisions between the um, Anglo-Saxons and the Normans really started to break down because of... Um, you know, economic pressures uh, and so forth. Um, but we have to remember that the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans were very closely related northern peoples. The Normans were originally settled in Normandy by Duke Rollo in about the year 910, I think it was. Uh, and they were uh, Norsemen. Um, you know, so we, we have a whole bunch of uh, different tribes. Each time you get a few tens of thousands of um, uh, some northern tribe or other, you know, basically moving around and then there's some, you know, pressure like climate change or or um, uh, barbarians from the east. Um, and that makes the um, population move around because if you had Attila the Hun chasing you in from the east, you'd move west and, you know, it's not very nice for the uh, Burgundians or the Teutons. Um, but this is this is just real politic, you know. Um, and unfortunately, we're in a similar kind of situation now. But the point I'm making is that these people were not migrants, or they were well, they were migrants. They're not immigrants in the same way as we think of immigrants now. Um, I saw a figure that something like three hundred and fifty thousand um, non-British nationals 
uh, are receiving benefit in this country. Now, I don't know what the average of that is. Just take a round ballpark figure of, say, £100 a week, um, and possibly more because of the housing benefits they'll be receiving and so on and so forth. Um, but if we say that those uh, people each um, cost this country £100 a week, probably more, but £100 a week, um, 350000 or so, and I uh, worked that out as to be approximately £2 billion a year, which unemployed migrants uh, cost the exchequer and the people of this country. So I don't think that uh, when um, the, the Anglo-Saxons were defending against the Danes or or uh, when they were defending against the Normans, I mean, they were hardly going to be giving these people, um, well, health care, of course, you know, um, uh, housing, um, you know, unemployment benefits. I mean, unemployment benefits is just something that's completely unheard of before kind of, you know, the early 20th century. I mean, it was spe it was spe um, speculated on in the late 19th century. I think uh, Lloyd George's government might have been the first one to uh, implement it. But I mean, we're talking a completely different age. These people are not immigrants in the way that we see it. Um, it's the same as with the American um, issue, you know, because uh, I hear a lot of people saying the same thing about all oh, Americans are immigrants. No, they're settlers. There were pioneers, pioneers who went there, took a big risk. Settlers who followed the pioneers. They settled, built the infrastructure. Then the people who saw opportunities came along, the entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, then all the then the real immigrants come along, you know, several generations. They say, all right, there's a good scene there going on. Oh, look, there's some free housing and some free welfare benefits. Yeah, I think we'll go there. This is not the same. So when Michael Meadowcroft says that we've always had immigration, this is completely... This is just total obfuscation about terminology. Um, I mean, and to talk about, you know, oh, yes, well, we accepted the Huguenots, you know, um, people like uh, Stefan Molyneux and uh, Nigel Farage probably descended from the Huguenots. Uh, 50,000 French people, again, very closely related uh, peoples, um, over several decades... Uh, and these people were, they were refugees. They were receiving um, uh, religious persecution um, in France uh, as Protestants. Uh, and so they came here as a Protestant country. Again, not much like what we're having with the migrant wave at the moment, where the vast majority of them are Muslims. They're not fleeing Muslim countries. Most of them are economic migrants. The Frontex and EU stats have demonstrated that somewhere between 60 and 85 percent of the migrants who have come into Europe in the last couple of years are just economic migrants, have no genuine case for refugee asylum, anything like that. Slightly off the topic here, but you see what we get is these liberal lefties, they're constantly obfuscating and uh, talking around the subject so as to get away from the real facts. The real facts are that up until quite recently, um, the number of people from abroad who came into this country who were not uh, ancestrally uh, related to the uh, indigenous population, which, you know, have been here basically um, since the uh, arrival of the um, first settlers after the Ice Age, you know, there's still something like 80% of the uh, genetic population in this country have substantial um, uh, deep past DNA from the first settlers um, and uh, yes we've absorbed we've absorbed invasions we've absorbed settlers we've absorbed a few um, refugees um, but when these people say oh there's always been migration it makes it sound like yeah yeah well you know we've always had um, We've always had Islam, haven't we? You know, um, yeah. Well, like when they used to, um, you know, uh, sail up. They once sailed up as far near, nearly. They nearly attacked Iceland. Uh, the the Barbary pilots, and uh, I think they attacked um, Ireland uh, a few times, and of course uh, Rome. So. You know, this we, we I don't think we actually got any um, back in the you know dark ages, but um, 
you know, this is this is what they're trying. They're trying to persuade us that the real history that we had, you know, just didn't exist, and that uh, we we aren't a people. Um, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, Semitic and Asian people from the Middle East and South Asia. You know, yeah, we've always, no, we haven't had these people before, and it. The trouble is, you see when you get shut down by these social justice warrior people you, you don't even get the chance to properly develop the argument because i i i believe sincerely that a lot of this uh, migration is not very good for the people who do it and it's not very good for the countries they come from because they are often usually even the most um, enterprising the most uh, um energetic people from their countries and uh you know, it's in my view, places like Pakistan um, should not be um, exporting doctors to this country. Uh, you know, maybe they should be sending their people here to get trained and then they should go back. So we would get the training money, they would get the training and it would be an equal balance. But now, it's not very good for Pakistan, for all their doctors, to seek out a better life and um, higher wages in Britain or the West because they're they're just they're just denuding their country of uh, talent and and wealth um, and then and then it, it leads us to say oh we don't need to uh, do all these things because we can import the labor uh, meanwhile um, you know our, our, our society is shrinking I I trained and worked as a nurse back in the 80s and 90s and um, even back in the late 70s, even actually, I worked as a nurse um, before I trained. And um, then in the early 90s, shortly uh, after I did my training, they um, they abandoned this nurse training. They put it all up. This is classic, classic leftism. Um, they built the uh, they, they made a um, the nurse training into a degree course and um so it was just administrators so you didn't actually have to have any ground level nurses to actually do the stuff so you get more immigrant nurses and obviously the problems are uh, uh, concomitant with that which is that often immigrant nurses don't have full command of english which is not good when you're in something like the medical profession and the nursing so immigrations Immigration weakens us. It uh, erodes our democracy by uh, giving um, the vote to uh, people who have no real long-term interest in our country other than to uh, impose their influence on it the way that uh, Islam is doing. Um, and they're uh, depriving their own country of uh, their resources, or they do send lots of money back, so that deprives us of the money which would be recycled in our economy. So it's all just kind of a bit of a mess. And I think it's just really, really disappointing that these people um, either think that um, it's just really good. You know, why should we worry about the fact that, oh, and this is another point that I never got, you know, to mention because it was shut down, the debate was shut down that uh, we all know that because of the birth rate um, and uh, the aggressive um, attitude that certain demographics um, have within our population, um, that if tra present trends continue, then um, there will be um, more, the, the white indigenous population will become a minority um, by about the middle of the century and possibly before. So um, these people who think that this is all good, it's all good, why should we worry? You're just a racist if you don't want this to happen or if you're against it in any way. Um, when actually it is the death knell of our civilization to be overrun. I mean, you know, this is like, um, I should think... Uh, Gibbons probably had something on this. Um, so I think it was a very disappointing talk. And um, 
I think it's really, really interesting how the liberal left think they're being open minded. But um, the, there were various comments in the talk about uh, various remarks, sidelong remarks, not properly engaged. They're just sidelong ad hominem remarks to uh, referring to the BNP or the NF and sidelong remarks about racism, um, not actually dealing with what is racism? You know, I'm, I'm going to write a blog on this about Tolkien because um, this whole concept of racism is a construct. Um, and I think a lot of people know that um, Leon uh, Trotsky, the uh, extreme left wing Russian revolutionary, uh, had a lot to do with this. I'm not sure whether he actually invented the term, but he certainly promoted it as a term of um, a means of shutting people down. You call somebody a racist and they all shut down. So it's really important to be able to sort of confront these allegations, these names, these ad hominem attacks that people make. Um, because really, I what I thought was so interesting, it was like, I mean, you do hear, you know, well, they were like Pavlov dogs, really. They were, you know, um, giving out the uh, required um, uh, response to the queued up stimulus. You know, you say the word immigration and they'll go, oh, oh. we don't like people who talk about immigration. Um, and they have no, they have no desire to even know facts about it or to debate um, where this might lead. Um, and uh, towards the end, I uh, should wrap up now, but towards the end, I did uh, afterwards, I briefly spoke with the um, the Scottish chap, Alistair, but he was in so much of a hurry to get his train back to London. He took that as an excuse to basically not give me any response when I tried to say, look, you know, what's the difference? We need to see the difference between the... Um, freedom of movement and settlement but he, he wouldn't give me enough and I tried to talk to the moderator Paul about this um, but he was kind of hiding behind um, packing up equipment um, and I, I'm i really I th what I find most interesting about this of all is the it's like the um, the psychological reasons behind this now I know we have the, you know, we had the hard leftists who clearly wanted to um, bring down our society, turn it into a fragmented chaos. Um, then you had the liberal who wants to do that by kind of um, softer means. Um, then you have the guy who's the, the nearest to anything on the right. Um, but he is totally only civic nationalist and... Uh, you know, freaks out at the thought that, um, you know, you might actually have identity. I mean, I couldn't get close to these things because the psychological obstacles in the people I'm talking to are just so immense. They they change the subject. They look away. They won't talk to you. Um, they find reasons to simply... I. It's almost as if their their mind kind of ha hazes over or something. Um and I've been through a lot of experiences which have taught me to be able to hang on and not get immediately emotionally reactive to something, but to be able to ride that out and look at things and say, well, what's this really about and what's going on here? And take a slightly more kind of reasoned analysis. Um, whereas the left... I think they've just been so conditioned over the years that um, the moment these words come up, they then they they're not able to think rationally about it. They're not able to think in any kind of uh, inquiring, empirical way, look at facts or anything like that. They just um, they've been conditioned like the monkeys in the cage. You might know of the example of the monkeys in the cage um, who. Um, put a monkey in a cage and uh, there's bananas over in the corner. It goes over, picks up the banana. And the moment it picks up the banana, it gets an electric shock through the metal floor. Right. So it puts the bananas down. Right. So you put another, you put another chimpanzee in the chimpanzee. The new chimpanzee looks at the 
looks at the bananas, thinks to himself, I'll have one of those. So it goes over, picks up the bananas, electric shock. So right, that third one comes in, um, does the same thing. Uh, so by the time that possibly the third or the fourth or something chimpanzee comes in the room, the moment the ones that have been in there already and seen this happen once or twice, uh, see the new chimpanzee going for the banana, they stop that chimpanzee because they know they're going to get a shock. So basically they don't even let get the shock because they're just stopping the new chimpanzees. No, no, don't touch that banana because we'll all get a shock. And that is the moral of the story I'm talking about here. This is basically, I think that this is, this is, this is working at the level um, of subliminal um, consciousness. The, I don't think they realise what they're doing. They're just so completely conditioned into fear of discussing these things because um, you can't you can't get anywhere with these people. They shut you down. They freak out. They shout at you. This is the left. So I would say, you know, if anybody from the lead salon gets to watch this, I would say you need to widen your mental perceptual faculties and take things in and um, uh, discuss things that uh, you haven't um, previously allowed, such as um, the identitarian movement. Um, they would probably all say, oh no, we've just got to uh, steer clear of this far right, you know. And the, oh yeah, well I won't go on about it because I should be shutting down, but that leftist guy, the way he just kind of snarked on about Trump and the, how all these ignorant people were voting for populism and everything like that, you know. And um, they completely disregard the fact that these are the system, you know, uh, I've said before and I will say again, democracy has its problems, but working within the system as we have it, we have to abide by the system and... Brexit won and Trump won and snarking at this all that you like will never change these things. These people have to move forward and accept that these things will happen and and that um, there are rising forces within the population. People are very, very concerned about this erosion of this democracy, which is in many ways flawed, but if we have millions of people who want to change it, then, you know, it will change if, if, if these people come into our country. So the great threat to democracy, which these people were supposed to be talking about last night, uh, is that we will be flooded out by people of a foreign, uh, alien um, peoples and um, alien cultures and uh, we all know that Islam wants to take over the West. So, you know, you can kind of see where this is going. You know, uh, Labour has been take is being in the process of taken over by um, Islam. Um, there seems to be some kind of struggle going on for the heart and soul of the Labour Party. And uh, Islam seems to be beating the Zionists, this is what I understand. Um, and... Uh, Obviously, Labour has this unholy alliance with Islam and they want to open the borders and, you know, everything would just pff, dissolve. Um, so even the civic nationalist guy who was in favour of Brexit, he's not really any better than the rest of them. And um, because he wants open borders, he said no board. He didn't want no borders, he just wants open borders. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? So... Um, we just didn't get anywhere near the real topic. So I'm just very disappointed. Uh, it was very exciting, though. Um, I do enjoy uh, trolling uh, this kind of thing, which is, I kind of guess, what I was doing. And I came back home afterwards and um, had a nice chat with my um, friend uh, in the pub afterwards. But then I came home and I saw a marvellous video by uh, Mike Cernovich about that stupid woman who uh, did the uh, really, really bad offensive um, uh, thing about uh, Trump. I, I, I won't even mention it because you know what it was. It's utterly disgusting. Um, and I watched that and I saw Mike Cernovich saying, I am going to break these people. I'm going to destroy them. And, uh, well, I, I don't... 
I don't want to destroy these people, but I certainly want to troll them because, unfortunately, they're just... Their narrow mind blinkers are like this, you know. It's like they say, oh yeah, no platform for uh, right-wingers or or people who have nationalist identitarianism kind of views or anything like that. So basically, what they say is, no platform for anybody who disagrees with me. Oh, I'm a triggered snowflake. Oh. So anyway, uh, I think I've... Um, uh, I think I've covered most of everything there. I've gone on rather longer than I anticipated to, but I haven't done a video for a while. So I hope my um, subscribers enjoyed that. And um, if you like... Oh, I better add this on to the end. Sorry, it's going on so long. But if you like um, my... Well, I wouldn't exactly call myself contrarian, but my uh, perhaps trickstery attitude to challenging these people, you may be interested to uh, look at um, my book, um, Waking the Monkey, which uh, you can see here's the cover. It's called Waking the Monkey by Claire Ray Randall. And um, um, uh, in that you will find um, a story of um, how I uh, took this attitude to... Um, or how this attitude of mine kind of evolved a little bit more when I went to a um, New Age camp in the 90s. Because I was very New Age in the 90s and I was kind of somewhere up into the noughties. Um, but this was the seminal experience which began to make me realise that social conformity, um, when it is only the kind of, you know, brainwashing that we get from the left, um, is... Uh, not the path that we should be taking. And so I had a very kind of um, extraordinary series of experiences um, of a trickster-like nature, which led me to realise that um, succumbing to imposed solutions from above is uh, not um, the way to go. So um, perhaps uh, some of you might be... Um, interested to check that out and there's so many so many interesting and unusual things about that story which have come to my attention since I published it two years ago um, so uh, I hope some of you will check that out um, okay well thanks for watching and um, I'll be back soon okay cheers bye ironic that uh, we were having people tell us um, the failings of democracy and I might get onto that in a bit. But um, at the same time, they uh, completely blase about the completely inadequate um, and undemocratic systems we have for representation in the EU, which is principally why I'm, uh, I, I'm glad we're getting out. Um, one of the things that came up was um, it was a kind of you have this complete cultural Marxist um, kind of reversal of values because um, there were these people up there principally the two lefties um, saying how um, awful it was that these uh, uneducated oiks um, were allowed to have a vote that could actually take us out of the EU and this was completely you know we, we should um, we, we, we heard about the uh, how we're moving into the um, <clears throat> post-democratic age, the technocratic age. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, remarks that people like Peter Mandelson made after the um, uh, referendum result. Um, I'm not sure it was him, but somebody said um, something to the effect of this was too big a decision to be made by the people. Oh yeah, people like Mandelson, you know, we really trust him, don't we? <clears throat> right, so, actually terribly enlightening because so much of the time was spent justifying or not or arguing against the uh, whether we had a referendum last year well we did have a referendum it was decided in parliament uh, it was part of the public uh, part of the conservative manifesto we had the um 
uh, we had the referendum, it was a decisive uh, vote, we've been through blah blah blah, all the stuff that's happened since, and uh, the leftist guy particularly was still going on about it, um, and uh, how he didn't think it should have happened, and then uh, Michael Medicroft, the Liberal, um, was saying, oh, he didn't think that referenda should ever be used, it's just um, absolutely, um, completely up beyond the pale, uh, it should all be left up to the elected representatives, even if they decide to do things which they never discussed in their manifestos. <clears throat> and, um, well, the Scottish guy, he was a bit more reasonable. Um, he, um, you know, agreed that it would probably be better to uh, for Britain to cut loose of the EU. But there was absolutely no discussion, other than my friend who I was sitting with, um, she raised the point at one point about the uh, completely undemocratic nature of the EU and uh, the way that the people there run it. So um, it was kind of... Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for dropping by. Um, I've got a little bit of an impromptu video today um, because I went to an event last night um, here in Leeds. It was the Leeds Salon. Now, the Leeds Salon is uh, not uh, related, I believe, to the uh, Salon uh, website, but um, it's uh, a little bit in the left kind of ballpark like that. Now, the topic for the debate, um, which was held at the Carriage Works in the centre of Leeds, was uh, the future of uh, democracy. And we had three guests... Uh, one was a Scottish gentleman from uh, the Institute of Ideas in London called Alistair. Um, there was a uh, gentleman who uh, was clearly from the far left um, called Stephen. And then there was a, the former MP for my um, constituency, Leeds West, Michael Medicroft. Um, and he was superseded by uh, John Battle in 1987. So Michael Medicroft was a Liberal Democrat. And um, obviously we were talking uh, mostly about um, the Brexit election, because that's what's going on at the moment. And um, it was quite... I didn't really find the discussion. Most of the questions really kind of fairly insubstantial. I mean, you know, they covered some minor points about... Uh, you know, what caused people to have these different opinions and such like that. But I, I didn't think it really went very far. And I managed to, um, anyway, get my oar in. And uh, I hope this is something that my um, some of my subscribers uh, will enjoy this little story. Uh, it's the kind of thing that goes down well, I think. Um, because um, I, um, only the word until um, about two-thirds of the way through the evening, the word immigration had only been mentioned once by one of the questioners and it was a fairly tangential remark, so it wasn't a major point of the question. Um, so I, uh, when I got my chance to ask a question, I put my hand up and I said, well, I'm not, I'm one, the, uh, the subject of immigration has only been raised once, even mentioned, and um, surely this is a really big thing because I said, since we've been suffering the uh, invasion of uh, migration in the last 20 years. So, and then at that point, there was this, like, this, um, this, uh, this babble, this roar of, of heckling and, and shouting at me, booing from people behind. It was quite interesting because um, the speakers seemed to be unaware of the irony that they were complaining about the um, whether you know democrat dem democracy was being properly implemented and at the same time um, suggesting that uh, these chavs you know that most of the population are made up of it would seem um, by their view uh, had the uh, audacity to vote to get out of the uh, EU um, uh, against what they clearly wanted and um, I was very very impressed that um, the camera guy um, 
I made a video, but it had some technical problems. The camera guy, they had their own high quality video. Um, and the camera guy ma made this point that they seem to be complaining about, um, you know, the failure of democracy and, and complaining about the people who, who were actually comprising the democracy. And um, <clears throat> I'll get on to this in a bit. Um, but uh, it seems to me that they're perhaps some of these people not satisfied that we've yet been outbred. Um, so what it was, yes. Um, really, I'll just get straight to the, the main point here because I, I found